right. Good morning. Merry Christmas. Uh, don't we love when Miranda does announcements? I mean, I know she's got a cheering section over here, which is, yeah, the Hanson crew. That's awesome. Uh, we love Miranda. Hey, uh, if you're a guest or visitor, so excited that you're here with us and worshiping. I hope and pray that you are getting excited for Christmas above and beyond the presents and the food and, and all the celebration. I, I hope your hearts are being pulled to something deeper. I, I hope that this season your, your mind is being pulled in a different direction, maybe even uh, a different direction than you've ever experienced before. And I, and I hope that this community is, is part of that uh, process. Well, we are in a, a beautiful series called Our King. And if you have your Bibles with you, please turn to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And as you're uh, turning to that, it's also going to be on the screen. Would you please stand? Uh, this is the chapter and verse that we've spent the last several weeks in. This is the verse we'll be in today, and it's also the verse that we will highlight on Christmas Eve as we look at Jesus as the everlasting Father, and what exactly does that mean for you and I. Uh, and so we're starting today in this passage, and this is actually a prophecy about Jesus' birth and was prophesied uh, 700 years before he was born in that stable, before that night, before that frantic night of trying to find a place to birth a child, as if you don't have enough to think about, uh, 700 years before that night. And this is what the scripture reads, for a child is born to us, a son is given to us, the mighty government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called, help me with this, we do this each week, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Let's pray together as you stay standing. God, we, we stand before you today and we acknowledge the magnitude of what took place that night when Jesus was born. We also admit and, and acknowledge to you that we don't understand the magnitude, but we want to. We want to understand why did you give the prophet Isaiah these names that your son would be called, not just on that night, but forever time. Why did you give these names? We want to understand that. Not for knowledge sake, but for life change sake. And so that's what we ask. We ask this morning that you would take us deeper into your truth, deeper into an understanding of the scriptures, deeper into who you are and who you are for us today. That's our prayer. We pray that in Christ's name. Amen. You can go ahead and have a seat. Uh, last year, Sandy and I hiked to Diamond Lake. Any of you hike uh, to Diamond Lake before? Uh, it's up near Nederland. It's just a, a, an incredible hike. It's, it's probably 5.7, 5.8. It's under six mile round trip. It's an incredible hike. Uh, you see uh, an incredible amount of wildlife and flowers and you, uh, you, you have to climb across a waterfall and it's, it's about 1.2-ish miles uh, up. Um, both ways, but then you're able to descend down into this beautiful lake and you see the, the crevices of the mountains all around this lake. And if you've been to Lake Tahoe uh, in California, in that kind of general area, it's very similar to that, just beautiful, clear waters, cold as can be, but absolutely gorgeous. And I remember when Sandy and I did this hike, for one, uh, in between my wheezing uh, to keep up with Sandy, uh, I was able to acknowledge the beauty and the wonder of which we were walking through. And, and as we crossed over the, the significant waterfall, which then you begin to descend down, uh, when we crossed over that waterfall, I remember stopping, not in the midst of the waterfall, but once we got over the waterfall and turning around and looking at the enormous landscape and standing in awe of the power of our God the creativity and the wonder of our God, to create all of this out of a spoken word, to have anything at his fingertips and to create beauty. And I couldn't help but to see his fingerprints all over it. Maybe you've had the same experience. We've had some pretty incredible sunsets over the past couple of months. 
Maybe you've seen it over a sunset. Maybe you've seen it over a starry night. You know, uh, if you live too close in the city, you don't see it. But if you can get away, if you can get up into the mountains, if you can get away from the busyness and the traffic and the cars and the people, and you can stop and look up in the middle of the night and just see God's array of stars, and you sit in wonder of that. Uh, maybe you've done this as you were on a hike. You, you stand in awe of the creator of the universe, our mighty God. That's what we're talking about today is the mightiness of our God, our King. And, and we're using Isaiah 9 to kind of prop this up. And if you remember, not only was, was this prophecy given 700 years before Jesus was born, but it was, it was given in a very tumultuous time. It wasn't a time of peace. It wasn't a time of, of wealth. It wasn't a time of everybody getting along. It was a time of war and disaster and heartache and want. And yet hope was given. Our king, Jeremiah, is a prophet in the Old Testament. And he has this beautifully crafted scripture that talks about how great and how mighty God is. If you want, throw your thumb in Isaiah, turn to thir- uh, Jeremiah chapter 32. Uh, it's interesting because it starts with a word. Uh, Each week, we've been looking at a lot of the Hebrew text uh, in regards to these names given by God, and and we we look at these Hebrew names and these uh, Greek names in the New Testament because they help us understand more. Our English language is very, very limited, and so we tend to look at the uh, the original language so that we understand better, and this is no different. It's interesting because it starts with a word called ah. A-H. Say it. Yeah, that's not bad. We'll get better at it. Now, ah is a Hebrew word, but it actually means painfully to groan. Anyone gone through labor recently? Or you remember labor? Any of you moms remember labor? Do you know the word ah? Yeah, it's pain. Sorry. Uh, Sorry, it's coming. Um, Where's Manda? It's coming, sorry. Anyway, so it, it's this word, ah, it's a Hebrew meaning it was this painful groan. It's like, ah! Truly, that's exactly what it is in the Hebrew scriptures. It, it's, it's this shouting of a pain. I want you to guys to say it with me. Ready? One, two, three. Ah. Yeah, you're still kind of like saying just ah. I, I, it's like it's, it's, it's got to come deep and then come out. So find here, maybe strengthen your stomach a little bit, and then push. All right, ready? One, two, three. Ah! Ah, Yeah, that is this word. This is ah. And that's how Jeremiah starts this passage. We substitute, because we don't want to be weird, we substitute the letter O instead of ah. But it's the same idea, and so it would read like this, ah! Sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth by your strong and your powerful arm. This pain, this groaning, this is God. This is Jeremiah as he describes this. In other words, what's too hard for God? Nothing. This this yelling of you are so sovereign, nothing is beyond your ability. I cannot say it with enough, ugh. That's what the scriptures are saying. You can see why we put in, oh, because how in the world do you describe that in the scripture? Maybe you've come to church today and you've got problems. Nothing's too hard for God. You've got problems, you've got struggles, they're they're heavy on your mind. Maybe your marriage is a mess and you think, my gosh, where is this even going? How am I going to fix this? Well, you're not, but nothing's too hard for God. Maybe you're struggling financially, maybe you've lost your job and you're like, this is the worst time. How am I going to fix this? How can I be out of work right now? How can I be dealing with this right here, right now? Ah, God, you have to intervene, O sovereign Lord. No matter how bad it looks, and for some of you or your family or your friends 
or people you work with, you know their stories, you know what they're going through, and it looks and seems awful. And you think to yourself, how is this ever going to work out? And let me tell you, nothing's, nothing's too hard for God. Nothing's so heavy that he's not mighty enough to pick it up. Nothing. God is the Almighty. He is the All Powerful. He is al- our, our Almighty. He's our King. You see, the Latin word for ah is omni. If you're taking notes, that's an interesting point. Ah, this O, oh, this shouting, this guttural uh, groaning is ah. That, that Latin word is omni. And omni describes some of the characteristics of God. It all works together. This book, the, the scriptures, this isn't just a bunch of how-to. It all has a plan. And it all fits together like a beautiful, perfect puzzle. Some of these characteristics, first, God is omniscient. He is ah. He is omniscient for you. Now that means God, he knows everything. You don't. And the Bible says he actually knows your thoughts. For some of you, that's problematic. But he still loves you. He's omniscient. He knows your thoughts. He knows when you're smiling, but inside you're actually groaning. He knows when you're singing your hallelujah, but inside you're actually shouting at God in his face. He knows when you look the part, but inside you're deteriorating before his eyes. He's omniscient. He's ah. He's oh, sovereign Lord. He's mighty God. That's who he is. That's pretty powerful. And every now and then, we think we've got this power. We, we think we're omniscient. We think we know what's best. We think we know all things. And we're not. And actually, there's some peace in that. There's some peace in going, I'm not omniscient. I'm not, ah. But God is our great God and King. He's omniscient. Number two, if you're taking notes, God is also omnipresent. Some of these things maybe you've heard thrown around or if you're new to church or new to the Bible or if you've stumbled in or, or someone brought you, these, some of these things might be new or might, maybe it's review, but God is also, ah, he's omnipresent. God is everywhere. This is one of the things about God that amazes me the most. Right now, here in Boulder, here in Louisville, in Juarez, Mexico, in Vietnam, Africa, Siri, Superior, Louisville, everywhere, all over the world, right now, people are arm in arm in Haiti and Australia and South Africa and Fiji. I'd like to go to Fiji. The Bahamas, Korea, the Philippians, Russia. No matter where you are today, God is with you. God is with you. He's with you in your struggle. He's with you in your doubt. He's with you in your fears. If you're watching online and you're in another state, another country, he's with you. That's mind-boggling. It's mind-boggling to think that we will gather on Christmas Eve. We will hold candles. We will sing songs. We will talk about the birth of Jesus. We will eat some great cookies and have apple cider. And we will join with millions and millions and millions of people that God is with you in your struggle, in your joy, in your labor, in your job search, in your counseling session. God is with you. When you're up all night in tears and struggle because as a parent, you don't know what else to do, God is with you. He's omnipresent. God's presence is everywhere. God, our King, this omnipresence absolutely blows me away. And another characteristic of God is this. God is omnipotent. He's ah. He's omnipotent. That means that God can do anything. Do you believe it? We like to say yes, but then we don't invite someone to Christmas Eve. I don't know if they're going to come. I don't know if they're going to reject me. 
We say God can absolutely do anything, and yet someone's diagnosed with a terminal illness and we don't pray because we just kind of chalk it up to, well, that's their lot in life. We think of a marriage falling apart and, and we don't continue to fight with God because we go, ah, man, we've tried. It's, it's done. God can do anything. The living word is full of, of signs and wonders and miracles. And it wasn't just limited for back in the Bible times. It's a sign and a wonder and a revelation of who God is, who he is in your life, who he is in my life, who he is in this world. You know how many Christians have literally given up on Boulder because they're like, that place is crazy. And it very well might be. But so many have given up on Boulder because it is so unchurched on a regular basis in the top 5% most unchurched counties in the nation. That's where you live. That's where God has planted this church. Because I believe, and the elders believe, and the pastors believe, because he can show his power. He can show what he can do. There's nothing too hard for God. He can do anything. And yet, often, when we're in this room, and we're singing songs, and Alex, with his Peter Brady voice, is leading us in worship, and some of you are too young, you're like, who the heck is Peter Brady in? And he's leading us. We go, man, yeah, God is all powerful. He can do anything. Like, this is amazing. And then we get in our car and we go home. We go get back to our circumstances. We get back to where we find ourselves and we go, "Ah, I just, I don't know. I don't know if God can come through. And I just want to speak truth to you. In wars, in famine, in pain, in suffering, in the midst of your life, God's power is omnipotent. It's beyond our recollection. And maybe today you're asking that same question, God, where is your power in my life? I've prayed. I've read the scriptures. I've gone to church. I've joined a life group. Uh, I've served in base camp. I've even held crying babies. Like I've done what I'm supposed to do. Where is your power? Maybe you're in a tough relationship and you go, man, how, how is God going to reconcile this? Maybe you've had a dream or, or a prayer request that God put so heavy on your heart and you've been faithful to pray for it. You've been faithful to dream it. You've been faithful to pursue it, but it's been 25 years. God, are you still powerful enough? It's normal to feel that way. But one of the reasons we do come to church is to be reminded of the truth. To remind, be reminded of, of who God actually is. So Jesus' power is real and we just may not see it the way we want to see it. So I just want to give you three very brief points if you're taking notes about this power. Number one, uh, Jesus' power is at work in you. Jesus' power is at work in you right now as you're seated here. You're not just sitting here on your own. His power is working in you. Paul wrote this in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. You see, God's power is real. We just don't see it all the time. Sometimes we miss it, but missing it or not seeing it or not experiencing it or hearing it or touching it doesn't mean it's not there. His work is at work all around us. And maybe that's you this morning. You think, well, I'm going to push back on that, Pastor Brian, like everyone else always gets the breaks. Everyone else always gets the green light. I always get a red light. Everyone else always gets the promotion. Everyone else always keeps their job. Everyone else always has a great marriage. Everyone else's kids are perfectly behaved. Like, I get what you're saying, but I don't receive that. I don't understand that because you talk about this power, I don't see it. Well, let me tell you, God's power is real. 
And God's power is working in you to change you, to allow you to become more like Him, to become more like Christ. That's His power. That's His number one focus, is to sanctify you, to make you more like Him, which consequently means to make you a servant. Colossians chapter 1 verse 29 says this, that's why I work and struggle so hard depending on Christ's power that works within me. Not the power of your dad or the power of a friend, but the power of Christ working in you. Every day, every moment, in every situation, that's our mighty God. It's His work in you. He's our King. Even if you don't want it, He's working in you. Second truth, write this one down. Jesus' power is working for you. You ever think about that? That the power of Jesus is at work for you. Now, don't get a hot head. Don't think, well, that means I'm boss. No, no, no. He's working for you, and we're going to unpack this. Here's what Isaiah chapter 40 says. The Bible says, He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the what? Weak. So before we start thinking of ourselves as lofty, this verse tells us He gives strength to the weary. So if you're weary in this room, you're in good company. And He increases the power of the weak. We live in a day and age where we want to uh, have this Outward appearance is powerful and strong, and yet the Bible says, if you're weak and weary, I'm going to give you power. You see the struggle? The Bible says, drop the facade. Drop the game. Drop the pretending. Be real before me, and I will increase your strength. I will increase your power. And I will increase the work that I'm doing in you. Now, the use in the Hebrew of that word means an Olympic athlete, the, literally the best of the best. I was watching a documentary this week. I just needed some brain dead time late at night, and I was watching a documentary on Navy SEAL training. And, you know, no one makes it except for freaks, and, and I have a friend who's one of them. But they, they were talking at this uh, place in the documentary how many Olympic athletes bow out within the first couple weeks. They can't handle it. They can handle the physical, but they can't handle the mental and the emotional. Their bodies can be pushed to the edge of, and the brink of break, but their minds and their hearts can't. And this is specifically talking about an, an Olympic athlete. It gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. And it goes on to say, young men, they stumble and they fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Where is your hope? There's a reason why we have four big red letters on that wall, and it will continue to stay there because people are looking for hope. They're looking for something to put their hope in. And I have to ask you, if you've not put it in Jesus because you think you've known better, how's that going for you? Are you happy? Are you fulfilled? Are you full of your, in, in your heart? Are you satisfied? Do you have the answers? Do you have contentment? Do you have peace? And maybe this hits home for you today. You're weary, you're fried, you're, you're worn out. It, it literally just took everything just to get to church. And you finally got here and then you're supposed to like, Alex says, hey, we're singing a Christmas song, so sing it happy. And you're like, dude, I am exhausted. I barely got here. Maybe that hits home. Maybe that's personal for you. You're exhausted. It's coming to the end of the year and you're just fried. Christy just finished a master's. Roll Tide. She just graduated last week. But the good news is God gives strength and power not to the proud, not to the ones who have it all buttoned up and looking perfect. He gives strength and power to the weary. 
The Apostle Paul had a weakness. He had a handicap, and he asked God, take it away. Not once, not twice, but three times. He's literally knocking on God's doors. He's saying, take it away, take it away, take it away. And God responds to him in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. You can turn to that. It's also going to be on the screen. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. And God says, in the midst of him begging for it to be taken away, my grace is all you need. And then he says, my power works best in what? My power, this, not Brian's words, God's words, my power works best in weakness. And yet culture says, don't show weakness. Well, wait a second. Scripture just said that my power works best in weakness. Why wouldn't I show weakness? Because it's not cool. Because people will talk. Because people will point fingers, because people will whisper. And then Paul replies, my power is at work, at best at work in your weakness. Paul replies, so now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. I'm happy to talk about my weakness because... I'm going to be able to see the power of Christ work through me. Christopher Broussard is going to sit up on the stage with me on January 5th. He told me a few weeks ago, I don't want to do that, but I know I'm supposed to. I don't want to sit up there. I, I, I don't really want to, but I know I'm supposed to. And he will bear his story. He will share his heart. And it's not a beautiful buttoned up picture with a nice red bow that's just absolutely perfect sitting over there. No. So I'm glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. I know Christopher's heart. That's all he wants is for God to work through his story. And then Paul goes on to say something very foreign. He says, that's why I take pleasure in my weakness. And in the insults and hardships and persecutions and the troubles that I suffer for Christ. And listen to this last sentence that Paul wrote. He says, for when I am weak, I am strong. Are you tired of pretending to be strong? Can we at some point get to a place where we can just admit to each other, I'm not as strong as I look. My faith, my marriage, my kids, my, my confidence in the United States government, my confidence in church, my confidence in this world, my finances, I'm just not as strong as I look. For when I am weak, I am strong. Friends, our mighty God is working right here, right now. And he's working for you to make you strong. And finally, the third principle of Scripture I want us to look at today is Jesus' power is at work through you. His power is at work through you. One of my favorite Scriptures is Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It says this, but you will receive what? What does it say? Power. power. Any of you remember as a kid sticking your finger in a light socket? <laughs> Ethan? Okay, that's shocking. Anyone else stick their finger in a light socket? You want to admit it? Yeah, see more hands. See, at first you're like, mm, no, not admitting that one. But then the pastor keeps asking and you're like, ah, fine. Raise your hand. You stuck your finger in a light socket as a kid or something you shouldn't. Yeah, see, you guys are like, dude, he said finger. I'm off. <laughs> yeah, all right. You stuck something in a light socket, right? Power. You will receive power. The Greek word for power is dynamite. How many of you ever seen something blown up by dynamite? How many of you want to? Yeah, it's awesome. I've seen a car blown up with dynamite before. It is the best. Blowing up things, are you with me? Blowing up things is the best. The, the word for power in the Greek is dunamis. Power, dynamite. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my what? Witness. 
When the power of God comes upon you, you will be my witnesses. It doesn't say when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you're going to be cool. Or you will have all of the answers. Or you will never be without want. Or you will never struggle with finances. It says, when the power comes on you, you will be my witnesses. This is what's going to happen. It's an if-then statement. Let's go back to middle school. If the power of God comes upon you, you will be my witnesses. Telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem and throughout Judea, Samaria, and to all the ends of the earth. That's who we are. That's Rock Creek Church. That's who we want to be. That's who we want to continue to grow to be. To all of the ends of the earth, we're going to share the good news of Jesus Christ because the power of God is upon us. And I want to tell you today that every one of you, if you are a Christ follower, you are an ambassador. You are someone that God wants to throw so much power into that it will blow your mind, not blow up, but blow your mind. Whether you're a stay-at-home mom, you're a teacher, you're a business person, you're an employee, you own your own job, you're an athlete, you're an actress, you're a vocalist, whatever you do, if you're a follower of Christ, you are an ambassador. And Jesus' power is available to work through you to blow your mind. And it can happen today. It can happen tomorrow. If you will step out in faith and have a go at it, Jesus' power works through you. I'll just use Sandy as an example. Yesterday, she went and got her hair cut. She looks unbelievable. She went and got her hair cut, ended up having a discussion with this gal, uh, ended up telling her about Rock Creek Church, came uh, walking to the car, called me and said, man, I just had a divine appointment. God was so good. And eh, it wasn't yesterday, it was the day before, whatever. It, it was an incredible haircut. Anyway, <laughs> so she, she calls me and she's like, oh, this is a divine appointment. And I said, I, too bad you don't have any uh, invites. You could invite her to Christmas Eve. And she's like, ah, I got one. And then ran back in and said, oh, you should come to the Christmas Eve service. Here's the invite. And what did she say? I'll think about it. I will. I Maybe. Go pound sand. I mean, she said something. <laughs> she said something to Sandy. But the, the rea- the, here's the reality. We don't know if, if she's going to come. But the power of God is at work through Sandy. The power of, of God is at work through you and wants to use you. Uh, there's... Paul describes these accolades, the, these incredible things that were taking place uh, with him preaching in the ministry in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And he says this, My preaching is not with lofty or impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. Rather than using clever or persuasive speeches, I relied on what? I didn't Google a bunch of really good jokes. I I didn't practice in front of the mirror. I I, I didn't make sure it was perfectly sharp. All I did was rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. And I can tell you for me, there is absolutely no reason I should be standing here before you today as pastor. It's not me, it's, it's not my strength, it's not my creativity, it's God. It's God working for me and in me and through me. I'm just an ordinary sinful guy called by God to a, a specific place in the church at Rock Creek Church. The more that you guys get to know me, you realize, man, he really isn't anything special. And you ought to. I love you and I love God. And maybe you can relate to that. Maybe you're sitting here going, I am nothing special. You looked in the mirror as you got dressed and you thought you matched and that you looked good and you looked at yourself in the mirror and went, hmm, just ordinary. Just me. And I love Jesus. 
I love that he calls people that are just ordinary, just like you, just like me, to do the unthinkable, to do the extraordinary. Because when Jesus' power comes in you and works through you, great things happen. And it could happen with a simple invite, a, a, a simple conversation with a neighbor. We talked about this in morning prayer. Alicia brought it up. For a lot of you, you would think I've asked you to walk on hot coals for a mile to go next door and invite your neighbor to church. I get it. It's scary. It shouldn't be, but it is. It's intimidating. No one likes to be told no. For you guys, it brings you back to junior high all over again. Just no, no, no. I get it. But that worker at the grocery store, at, at Costco, the, 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 the ladies and the men who hand out the, the free samples that prior to keto, I would put them out of business. Just loop Costco. Get a whole meal. No one talks to them. They just, they're like a bunch of vultures that just swoop in for nachos and then go to the next lady. Why not bring a, an invite in and go, hey, thanks for what you're doing. You live around here? I'd love to invite you to church. See what happens if God wants to work through you. Blast our, our Christmas Eve services all over social media. So many of you use it. You're all over Instagram and Facebook. Blast our stuff. Grab it and blast it. Invite people, invite people, invite people. Not for the sake of us becoming a big church. That's not our intention. But so that you can sit back in awe of what God can do through you. When you decide, man, all right, I'm going to take Brian up on this. I'm going to do the unthinkable. I am going to hit share. And maybe close your eyes doing it or have your kid come hit the button if you're that scared. If you're too scared to ask your neighbor, send your kid to go do it. Let them get the rejection. They got to learn somehow. You haven't. So let's change the next generation. I, I'm, I'm literally just kidding. But what I, but what I am saying is it's it's Okay. And maybe it's not Christmas Eve. Maybe it's our, our, our series that's coming up in January called Questions. That's a full apologetic series where we're going to tackle tough subjects like, is Jesus too narrow of a way to the Father? Why does evil happen in this world? Why, why do we do what we do? How, how does this, all this work? But he could use you to change your circle of friends, your family, your place of business, your school, because he's our mighty God. He can do it all. You see, Jesus, 2,000 years ago, chose 12 ordinary people. Just a ragtag group of men got together over a campfire and, and probably said, okay, you're probably wondering why I've called this meeting. And then began to share, and I'm sure they were wide-eyed. Fishermen, tax collectors, business people, they really didn't have anything going for them in the world's eyes. They weren't Pharisees, they weren't Sadducees, they weren't the experts in the law, they were just you and me. They were just normal, everyday people. They weren't spiritual leaders, and he took these 12 ordinary people, and when the power of Jesus worked through them, they did extraordinary things to change the world that you and I get to reap the benefits of today. Because they followed and trusted our King. He wasn't a king. He wasn't the king. He was our king. His name is Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And he's your king. How cool is that? Let's pray. God, we love you. We're still not quite sure why you love us. But boy, are we thankful for it. 
we continue to unpack these ideas of, of mighty God and, and Prince of Peace and Wonderful Counselor, and, and it causes us to wonder. It causes us to take a look at ourselves and, and how you view us. And thank you. Thank you for the awe and the wonder. Thank you that it's not religious practice. Thank you that it's not rote memory. Thank you that it's not something so plasticky and impersonal. No, it's very personal for when we are weak, you are strong and you give power to the weary. You give power to the weak. And there are those in this room and those who are watching and listening online and they are weary. They are weak. They at their, they're at their last thread of hope. And they need you. Father, please show favor and kindness to your children in need. And we love you. And we are so excited to celebrate as loud and as energetic and as crazy and as honoring to you, our King, on Christmas Eve. It's your day in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Would you please stand and let's continue to worship.